Good morning, church. It is great to have you here with us today. If this is your first time, my name is Pastor Greg Hintz. On behalf of myself and our leadership team, thank you so much for being here today. You picked a great week to come. We got some rough news this week as a state. Two more weeks with the stay-at-home order, with quarantine. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're finding ways to pass the time, stay engaged in a safe way for you, your family, your neighbors, your community. You know, and I love that people are really thinking outside of the box of how to entertain themselves, but also how to entertain others. And I love our very own worship leader, Jason Nordgren. One thing you may not know about him is that he has a meme channel. That's right. He makes memes on Instagram and Facebook. And you can check him out at Petty Christian Memes. You just search that, Petty Christian Memes, and, and, and you'll find Jason's stuff absolutely hilarious. I wanted to share two that I saw this past week that made me think about you. The first one is this one right here. It says, the worship leader, lift up a shout of praise. And then it's a picture of the people watching online. And what a difference. Now, I, I know that's not true for you today. I know that you are completely and totally engaged. You may be in your jammies. You may still have a bowl of fruit loops, but that's okay. You are engaged in hearing what God has for you today. The last one I wanted to show you was, was this meme I saw pop up on his page this week. It says, me, the quarantine probably won't last that long. The quarantine Betty White. <laughs> oh, well, today we got a brand new statement we're looking at that the Bible doesn't say. And to introduce that to you, I'm going to have our associate pastor, Pastor Rex Dawson. Take it over, Rex. This week, the saying is something that probably doesn't bother some of us very much right now. It is, money is the root of all evil. Listen to Pastor Greg explain the real sayings in the Bible. Thank you for joining us. You know, we hear that statement a lot, don't we? Money is the root of all evil. I mean, being a pastor, I hear that all the time. People talk about this quote from the Bible. Money is the root of all evil. And here, they're so close to the actual quote inside of the Bible that doesn't just say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you know what? When we think about that, we've seen that over and over again. The love of money pushing forward evil onto this world. And, and today we want to look at that. And it's going to be in the book of 1 Timothy. But before we get to that, I want you to know that this verse is a perfect example of something that we talk about over and over and over again here at the Place Church. And that is anytime you're reading the Bible, you have to look at a verse in context. Now, when we say in context, you have to look at the verses around it. You have to look at the author. What is he saying? Who is he saying it to? What point is he trying to get across? Now, when we're looking at this book, 1 Timothy, we know that it was penned by the Apostle Paul. And Paul is writing one of his disciples, Timothy. But I don't want to start just in the verse that we're looking at today. I want to back it up so we can look at this verse inside of its context. In fact, I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says this, But godliness... With contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is an easy, memorizable verse. This may be a good one for you to put into your memory, kind of bury in your heart, put in your back pocket, carry it around with you each and every single day. Godliness with contentment is great gain. 
You know, for me, I find it awfully ironic that this week we're talking about this verse because it's a conversation my wife and I have been having with my daughter for the past week. You see, my daughter's five going on 16, and she is absolutely the joy of our lives. And she knows that her birthday is coming up. Now, mind you, it's not until September but she knows it'll be here before you know it. And so now, every single thing she sees, she wants us to add it to the birthday list. And so the birthday list now is, is very long, from, from puppies to castles to cars. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on this list right now. Well, finally, we had enough the other day. We had to sit her down and talk to her about the power of contentment. And, and we taught it to her just like this. We said, it's important that we're happy with what we have, that we are called to be content. And, you know, it's, it's ironic that I would have that conversation and then come across this verse today because what I want you to see is that nothing has changed from the time that Paul penned these letters a couple thousand years ago till now, nothing has changed. There's still this desire inside of the human heart to be discontented. And even at, at a young age, even at an early age, even early on in life, You've probably found yourself in that position a time or two. Looking around, you have everything you need, but still you want more. Still there's something else pulling you forward. There's something else that you want in your life. See, it's, it's not a new concept. It's something that mankind has been wrestling with for eons, generations. It was a struggle that your grandparents had, your great-grandparents, your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. It was something that we struggle with each and every single generation. That's why that verse is so important for us as Christians to hold on to. Godliness with contentment is great game, but I want you to see what Paul says after that Verse. Check out this next verse in verses 7 and 8. They say this. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. With these, we will be content. You know, I think Paul, in the midst of this moment, is calling Timothy, is calling the hearers of this letter, the disciples, the church, to have a perspective shift. Because oftentimes, the things that cause us to be discontent aren't something as simple as the food in our belly or the clothes on our back. It's normally something else. Last week we looked at that as I shared a story with you about the Cadillac Katera. And if you missed that, I, I just want to encourage you, go back, watch last week's message, because we talked about the, the, these two verses linked together. This idea of being discontented, it's not normally just the normal things that we need that cause us to be discontented. But Paul is encouraging the church, is encouraging the disciples, is encouraging Timothy to have a perspective shift, not to be focused on all the things that you don't have. Have, but to focus on what you do have. See, today, if you were to take that step, if you were to do that thing, you would begin to make a, an exhaustive list of the incredible blessings that you have in your life today. You would begin to look at things like your health. You would begin to look at things like the roof 
over your head. For, for, for most of you, the air conditioning that is keeping you cool on these triple digit days, the ability to go to a refrigerator and pull food out and cook it on a stove, and we would just begin to list the things that we're grateful for, and we find that when we shift our perspective and begin to live in gratefulness and begin to live in thankfulness, then we're not concerned with being discontented because we find ourselves walking in contentment. For godliness with contentment is great gain. And then Paul goes on to say this, verse 9, but those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now, I want to just ask you a question. Have you known anyone, either in your life, in your family, generationally, or throughout history, that has fallen into this? For the love of money. For those who desire to be rich. Remember that word desire? We looked at that last week. Not, not only to desire, not, not, but to search for and to strive after. When, when, when that becomes the focus of life, to become rich, then the, the, the fruit of that decision is this idea of the love of money. And the Bible tells us that oftentimes people are plunged into ruin and destruction. Can you think of anybody? Could could you think anyone sitting behind bars right now that it was greed that drove them to do things they never would have done, but they just wanted more? You think about a Bernie Madoff who probably didn't start out with the desire to grow this Ponzi scheme to, to, to the place that it was, but before he knew it, that greed and desire was, was pushing him forward and many lives were plunged in to financial destruction because of that. And so we see that. You know, I, I, I love this because we can look at Scripture and say, yes. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Looking back at my life, yes, that makes sense. Yes, I've seen that happen many times. Yes, that is true. That there are some, when they desired riches, desired wealth, that it pushed them forward to do things they wouldn't normally do, which caused them to fall into destruction. But you got to see this next verse, because nestled right after verse 9 is verse 10, and verse 10 is our main focus verse of the day. It says this. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Evil. Godliness with contentment is great gain, but the love of money is a root for all kinds of evil. You know, when, when I think about that, I, I think that Paul is communicating to a person's heart, their desire, what, what they choose to live for, what they choose to make their primary purpose, what they choose to, well, let, let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. You know, when, it, when I think about this, I think about this shape right here. The, the, the shape is a shape of a, a pyramid. And when you think about your life, the things of your life all are going to fit into this, this pyramid. There, there are things that, that you have to do. That there, there are things that are going to take priority. There, everything has a place. 
And the only one who has the power to put the things in the places where you want them in your life is you. And when we read this verse, godliness with contentment is great gain. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I believe that it talks about the pyramid of life. The things that are most important to you. Now, when you think about your life where you are, one explanation that I've often used for people of identifying the priorities that they have in their life is this. How do you spend your time, your talents, or your treasures? Like, where does your money go? Where does your time go? What are you investing your talents in? What organizations are are you part of? What are you working at on a regular basis? How are you investing your time, your talents, and your treasures? That's going to tell me what the priorities of your life are. Now, you could look at me and say a lot of things. Notice in time, talent, treasures, I didn't say what they say, (laughs) what they write down, what they communicate what they want me to believe. You see, that's not the priority of your life. It's how you spend your time, your talents, and your treasures. And this verse is telling us in our life that there's a desire to want stuff, to want things, to be discontented, to be striving after, running after stuff, running after money. And when you think about money, money is an important part of our lives. All of us have to deal with finances. We got to pay bills, got to keep a roof over our head. We need to feed our families. We need to feed ourselves. We, you know, we have all this stuff. And so it's going to be somewhere in the pyramid of life. I believe that these verses, though, are warning us of where we choose to put this desire for wealth or finances, because in our lives, oftentimes, we can place it right here at the top. It's our primary purpose. It's our primary desire. It's what we want more than anything. It's, it, it's what we're thinking about all the time. I was reading this week, Screwtape Letters, which is an excellent book by C.S. Lewis. And ultimately, it's a conversation between two demons as they're working on someone on earth. And uh, the quote I want to share with you, though, really talks about this idea of money, finances, stuff, and the pyramid of life. Here's what it says. It says, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really it's finding its place in him. You think about those words. You think about those words. It's finding its place in him. Prosperity, money, stuff. Paul puts this into perspective. He says, this is always going to be part of your life. This is always going to be something that's there. You're always going to have to deal with this thing called finances. But he encourages the disciples. He encourages Timothy. He is encouraging you, and he is encouraging me. And he's encouraging us to take a look not only at finances, not only at stuff, but to take a look at our faith and to ask ourselves the simple question, and the question is this, where does our faith fall in the pyramid of life? If you're watching this, I mean, think about it. You've, you've watched almost a whole message now as we're almost finished. Uh, obviously, faith is somewhere in here. It's somewhere inside of your life, but where, where is it? What, what place does Jesus have in your heart and in your life? And, and I believe that Paul is communicating to the disciples, godliness with contentment is great gain. For the love of money is a root of all kinds 
of evil. He's calling us to look at these two things and allow money to be part of our life, but not the primary thing that allows a place for Jesus to be at the top of our life. And every priority that we have, everything that we deem to be important, Jesus comes first. He comes before our prosperity, before our achievement, before any of these things that we're driving after, before anything that our time, talents, and treasures would be spent on. Jesus is first. And I want you to think about that. You see, it's not money. Money is not the root of all kinds of evil. You know, money can be used to do lots of great things. Awesome things have been done. Right now, we're caring for over 250 orphans on the border of Uganda and Kenya in this little village called Busia that they are alive and well because of money, stuff, because the priorities of people said that Jesus is calling us to care for the widows and orphans. And so we're going to allow part of our finances to go to care for that which is important to Jesus. You see, those that have their priorities straight, Jesus is at the top. Now, maybe you look at your life and say, okay, Greg, I get it. Jesus is somewhere in there, but money is definitely up here. Or stuff or self, family. Family's in here. It needs to be way up here near the top. But family is not supposed to be over Jesus. Jesus is supposed to be first in our lives. And so I want to encourage you today. As you hear my words, as you think about the pyramid of your life, as you think about the many activities and stuff and things that you have to do each and every single day, as you think about how you're spending your time, your talents, and treasures, I simply want to ask you this. Where is Jesus? And if he's not here at the top, I want to encourage you that today is the day. Today's the day to put Jesus where he belongs in your life. And that's top priority in the top spot. Will you pray with me? Bow your heads with me. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for this vivid example in our lives of priorities. This vivid example of time, talent, treasures, focus, purpose, priorities. So much, Lord, has come out today, Father. And I pray for those that are listening right now that look at their lives and say, you know what, Jesus isn't at the top. There was a season when Jesus was at the top. I want Jesus to be at the top. But if I look at my life today, my time, talent, and treasures, Jesus is not there. I don't remember the last time I prayed. I don't remember the last time I connected. I don't remember the last time I asked God for forgiveness or wisdom or strength. But today is the day. And if that's you, I want to pray with you right now. I just want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin and my selfishness. But today, that's all going to change. I surrender to you completely. Jesus, I believe that you lived, that you died, and that you rose again. And I'm choosing to believe that you have a plan for my life. Take my life. It's yours. Now let me pray for you. Father, I pray for each and every single person that prayed that prayer. Each and every single heart that's watching right now, Lord God, that is being drawn closer to you. I pray, Father, that even in the midst of this moment, you begin to draw them closer. I pray that you begin to minister to their hearts. I pray, Father God, for forgiveness to sink in and a sense of purpose and destiny to rise up in the midst of their lives. I pray, Father, that they know without a shadow of a doubt that they are a child of God, that they are loved that they are forgiven and that your mercies, God, are new every day. Take them on your journey, I pray. I commit them, God, to your hand. And I ask you to use their lives to do something awesome on this earth. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Now, 
If you prayed that prayer today, here's what I want you to do. There's a number on your screen. I just want you to text the word, I surrender. That's it. All one word, I surrender. Text that word. And what we want to do is we're going to get you out a tool, something that you can begin growing in your faith, growing in your relationship with God. Just text, I surrender right now, and we'll get that right out to you. In just a minute, you're going to have the opportunity to give. That's right, to give to the work that God is doing inside of this community and ultimately all over the world. I'm really excited because we've got three ways you can give. If, if you've got a cell phone and you're into texting, you're going to see the, the number right there on your screen. Text whatever the amount is to that number. You can also go ahead and give on our website. Or if you just want to send out a check to 885 America Street, Wickenburg, Arizona, you can do that too. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that when you give, awesome things are taking place. You're allowing the work of God to continue inside of this community. All throughout the week, awesome things are happening. Testimonies are happening. People are getting saved. They're coming to know God. We're so excited about when we're going to be able to open up the doors again. And you're going to be able to hear the testimonies of how God has been moving in this season. Here's what I need you to know. I need you to know that God is alive, that his plans are perfect, and that he is on the move in this season. That he is using this faith community to make a difference, to make in to touch lives, people that have never heard the gospel before are starting to hear the gospel, are starting to respond, that their hearts are being open to the truth and lives are being changed. But that can only be done because of your faithfulness. And so I need you to know today that your faithfulness is making a difference. It's in these seasons of difficulty or struggle or trial when the rug seems to be pulled out that you stand up and say, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You stand up and say, for such a time as this, I have been blessed and I'm going to choose to honor God with my finances and continue to watch God move in my community, that God is moving in you and through you. So be encouraged. And I, I just can't thank you enough. You know, when I think about the 11 years, and I just posted on our Facebook page this past week, the very first water baptism we had 11 years ago. If, if you want to watch that, check that out. It was, in, it was in this lady's hot tub. We just went in the hot tub and we baptized. The very first baptisms that ever took place at the Place Church, you can watch today. But I want you to know that in that moment, seeds were planted. Seeds that we're going to change a community and we're going to change a people. And that's what's happening in your life. And I want you to know that if you need prayer, we want to pray for you. I want to pray specifically for your needs. In fact, we'll be waiting right after this service in a Zoom room. Now, the way you do that is you just look at the description. You just click on the link that starts with the word Zoom, or you'll see a Zoom link link here, and, and you can go to that. I'm going to have the staff waiting for you in that room, and we want to pray for you. So if there's anything that we can pray for you about, just go ahead on over there, and, and, and we'll pray with you and stand with you in faith. Please continue to, to pray. We cannot wait to see you again. It's great connecting online, but I can't wait to see you face to face. I cannot wait to gather this faith community and, and just allow these walls to hear the praises of God's people. Now, there's many other walls that have been hearing those praises now, homes and, and coffee shop, all kinds of different places where God is moving, but I cannot wait for us to come home. But until then, I want to encourage you, stay plugged in, stay praying, and know that this church is behind you 100%. Whatever you need, let us know, and we're standing with you today. I can't wait to see you back here, same time, same place next week. God bless you, and have a great day.